Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I just wanted to tell you about a book called Seven Sins of the Apocalypse. It's an anthology series available right now in paperback and on Kindle. And most importantly, it stars the author of tonight's story, Dale Drake. A link to Seven Sins of the Apocalypse are available in the description down below. And now, on to tonight's story. Jeffrey Donovan stepped out of the train at St. Austell, stuffing his mobile phone back in his pocket before quickly hurrying to the taxi rank outside. He jumped in the nearest car, dragging his bag in beside him before telling the driver in clipped tones that he was heading for Mevagizzi. The driver, perhaps sensing his haste, merely nodded his head and pulled out of the station. As Jeffrey fumbled his phone out of his coat pocket before once again hitting the speed dial for home. The phone rang maddeningly over and over again, and yet there was still no answer. Cursing quietly, he canceled the call and tried David and Jenny's house across the road. They weren't only neighbors, but good friends of the family. But there was no answer there either. It had been three days now since Jeffrey had last heard from his wife and children, and that time he had tried to ring them hundreds of times, all to no avail. The last time he and Tracy had talked, they had finally reconciled and he had agreed to come back home. She had promised to ring him back the very next day as it was getting late and the kids needed to go to bed. After another five minutes of chatting to his daughters, where they both told him how much they missed and loved him, and he himself openly crying, the call had ended with a hesitant love you from Tracy and a promise to call him back early the next day. But the call never came. He had waited patiently all the next day, not wanting to call before she was ready, not wanting to seem too pushy or desperate. After all, he had messed up big time, and was now slinking back home like a dog with his tail tucked firmly between his legs after his month-long banishment to his mother's house. Around 6.30 in the evening, he had finally caved in and rung, wanting to speak to the children before their bedtime. But there had been no answer. This in itself was strange. Trish was a creature of habit. Already on any normal evening, the girls would be in their pajamas by now, their teeth cleaned and ready for a couple of stories before bed, but the phone rang on and on. After his third or fourth try, he tried Trish's mobile, but still nothing. After a moment's thought, he gave it up and decided to try again after dinner, but the result had been the same. No answer. He tried again every hour on the hour till 9 o'clock before calling David and Jenny, but there had been no answer there either. This was actually putting his mind at ease somewhat. Perhaps Trish had taken the kids out with David and Jenny and their two little boys, maybe to play place or perhaps just down to the village park. After all, it was still early autumn and the nights were warm and balmy. And there was no rule saying kids had to be in bed by 7 o'clock every night. Nevertheless, he tried Trish's mobile once again, just to be sure. Got no reply. Frowning, he placed the phone back down into the receiver, just a little too hard, earning a raised eyebrow from his mother, who shuffled past in her slippers, a steaming cup of tea in her hand as she headed into the sitting room to watch the evening news. Sighing, knowing he was going to get 20 questions, he followed her in and tried to watch the news. He tried to ring Trish in Jenny's house twice more before sending Trish an email, asking her to ring him first thing in the morning. Finally, he went to bed, but his sleep was troubled. The next day was more of the same. He even went as far as to pull out the yellow pages and ring some friends in the village at random, but after trying the numbers of 11 complete strangers and getting no answers, he gave up and started looking on the internet for any news of power cuts in and around the Mevagizzi area. After finding nothing, he went back online and booked a seat on the first train back to Cornwall the very next day. Now he sat on the back of the taxi cab playing with his phone, rubbing it between his hands like a magic lamp only, instead of a genie, wishing for a call or even a text. Anything to let him know his family was okay. Quiet today. Jeffrey looked up from his musings. Sorry? He mumbled. The village, Cabby said. Quiet today. Jeffrey looked up, startled to see they were pulling into his very street. Just say where, Cabby said, nodding towards the silent houses. Uh, just here will do, Jeffrey said, reaching into his pocket for his wallet. He paid the driver a 20 and told him to keep the change. Cabby thanked him kindly and sped away without a backward glance. Jeffrey stared up his path, noticing the car was parked in the drive that suddenly stopped. Something was wrong. It was quiet, almost too quiet. In fact, it was dead silent. Not a seagull screeched in the sky, 
Now, laughing children could be heard from the nearby park, not even a Sunday lawnmower was running. He wanted to see somebody, anybody, but especially Trish, Trish and the kids. Anything to squash the sense of foreboding. Reaching for the door, he pushed the handle, half expecting it to be locked, but it wasn't, and the door swung open easily. Trish, he called, stepping inside and dropping his bag. Debbie? Lucy? Nothing. His word hung there, caught in silence. Trish, he called again, popping his head into the living room before heading down the hall to the kitchen. Girls, Dad's home! The kitchen was neat, orderly, and empty. He started to feel panic rise into his stomach, making him feel slightly queasy. He didn't stop, but took several deep breaths as he headed for the stairs, trying to get his whirling emotions under control. He jogged up the stairs, starting to feel angry. Where the hell were they? Trish, he called again, quickly opening the girls' room. Nothing. Next, he headed for the room he and Trish had shared for the last ten years, but it was empty too. In desperation, he even tried the bathroom, but it was also empty, just like the rest of the house. Not waiting, he dashed down the stairs and headed across the road to David and Jenny's house. He was halfway down the garden path when he noticed the window. It was broken. Hell, that was too nice a word. It was smashed. Even the wooden frame was broken. It was snapped and gouged. Jenny's fine white curtains billowed out through the shattered frame, flapping and tearing themselves on what was left of the splintered glass. Jeffrey stopped and licked his lips nervously. What the hell was going on here? It was like something from the Twilight Zone. Furious, he marched up the garden path, and without even knocking, he stormed into the house. He wanted answers, and he was going to get them. He stopped dead. The house was chaos, and... Oh God, was that blood on the walls? His knees felt like jelly. His legs could no longer support him. As with a groan, he slumped against the doorframe. There was blood. Blood everywhere, sprayed across the walls. Lakes of the stuff had soaked into the carpet. It had even burnt itself into the light bulb. Suddenly, the smell seemed to be all about him. The smell of copper pennies held too long in a tight fist. Feeling his gouge rise, he turned and stormed into the garden and threw up his lunch. Trembling, he stood up, wiping his mouth with the back of his hand. He stumbled back inside. Jenny! He called. David! He couldn't just leave. Even if he wanted to. What if they had what if they'd been hurt? And where were the kids? David! God damn it! He called, trying to avoid the blood as he headed into the kitchen. Where the hell are you? The kitchen was empty. But a complete wreck. Every cupboard door had been torn open and the contents strewn all about the kitchen as if someone had been frantically searching for something. The upstairs was the same. In the bathroom, the medicine cabinet had been torn from the wall and the shower curtain shredded and torn down. The kids' room was the same. The blankets were ripped from the boys' beds, their toys strewn about, and little Johnny's fish tanks smashed into a thousand pieces. Jeffrey said a small prayer of thanks. There was no blood here before going back into the landing and heading for the master bedroom. He was just about to turn the handle when the smell hit him. It was the smell of long dead ocean, of rotting seaweed, decaying flesh. It seemed to be crawling from under the door, floating through the keyhole, seeping from the very pores of the door itself. Raising an arm to cover his nose, he turned the handle and pushed his way into the room. He stopped dead, his hands dropping away from his face, his eyes widening as he took in the chaos within. There were dead things everywhere, octopus, squid, fish, all rotten and bloated. Seaweed covered the smashed furniture, covering the carpet, splattering up the walls and hanging from the ceiling in great strands. Both David and Jenny lay on the bed, covered in the loathsome weed. As he watched on in horror, a large crab pushed its way from between Jenny's tattered lips and scurried down her chest. A scream building in his throat, he backed out of the room, then bolted down the stairs, stumbling and falling, crashing into the wall. He turned and ran out of the door and into the street. He was in a full-blown panic now, screaming his wife's name, calling for his children. As he hammered on the door, it is and banged on the windows, looking for someone, anyone. He was halfway down the Van Drain driveway when he pulled up short, the house looming above him, acting like a hard slap to the face, bringing him back to senses. No one was here. Nobody ever came here. If ever there was a haunted house, a truly haunted house, the Van Drain house was it. Backing down the driveway, he turned and headed down the hill towards the harbor, throwing nervous glances over his shoulder till, till he crested the hill and the old house was safely out of sight. Below him was the village harbor, 
Usually it'd be busting with life. Cornish fishermen unloaded the day's catch, cleaning their boats and mending their nets, but now there was nothing. Not a person stirred. The only sound of the gentle lapping of waves and the cries of lone seagulls circling overhead. He was just about to start down and investigate further when he noticed movement out of the corner of his eye. There was a small boat out to sea, floundering, engine smoking as it sputtered its way towards a small, shingle-covered beach just just left at the local lighthouse. Jeffrey felt a pang in his heart as he remembered many a sun-soaked day spent playing on that very beach with his children, their laughter and screeches of delight as they paddled and swam in the cold waters. He had to find them, to find out what was going on here, to get some answers. Quickly, he ran down the hill into the harbor side, passing rocking boats and silent shops. Here there were more dead creatures and crawling seaweed, but he barely noticed as he ran towards the deserted beach. He could hear the boat's engine now, sputtering, failing. Hurrying past the lighthouse, he descended the stone steps, walking two at a time until he hit the beach and waded into the freezing waters up to his waist. Grabbing onto the now drifting boat, he hauled it onto the shallows until it wrung the ground. There was a man inside, lying face down in a puddle of water. Quickly, Jeffrey scrambled aboard, grabbing the man by the shoulders and hauled him over. It was Joe. Joe Thomas, a good friend of David and Jenny's, and sometimes an acquaintance of his own. Joe was a fisherman, a long line of fishermen who had lived and fished the surrounding waters for generations. Usually he was a big man with a round, smiling face, but now he was a, he was a shadow of his former self. His face sunken, his body wasted and emaciated, his breath was shallow and foul, and he struggled to breathe from beneath dry, parched lips. Order! He begged, his hands pawing weakly at Jeffrey's arm. Please, for the love of God, water. I have none, Joe, he replied, grasping the other man's hand. I'm sorry, I, I have none. What happened here, Joe? Where is everyone? Where's Tracy and the children? Please, Joe, he begged. You have to help me find them. Gone, Joe whispered. All gone. They took them. Took them to punish them. Who? Jeffrey grabbed at him. Who has them, Joe? Who has my children? Gone, Joe repeated. All gone. Not just your family, everyone. They took them down into the deep. It was our fault, all our fault. We didn't know. How could we know? What is it? What are you talking about? Jeffrey asked. Tempted to give the other man a shake, but not quite daring to do so. This. Joe gasped, opening his fist. There was a flash of gold as something clattered at the bottom of the boat. Reaching down, Jeffrey picked up the fallen object and stared at it in disbelief. It was some kind of idol. No doubt about that. An idol carved out of solid gold, but like nothing he'd ever seen before. Whatever creature it was meant to represent, he had never seen before. He could only describe it as an octopus. Like, like in nature. It's completely outside the nature, with its many tentacle-like arms and great staring eyes. It fascinated and repulsed him all at the same time. Where did you get this, Joe? He said, managing to drag his eyes away from it. Where in God's name did you get this? Out there, he gasped, his eyes rolling towards the ocean. We were trolling past Chapel Point. Our nets became tangled. We managed to get them free and bring them up, and the crane smoking and trembling under the strain when they... Surface, they were filled with large stones, blocks. It had pictures on them, like the old temples you see in Egypt. Hieroglyphics, Jeffrey murmured. You're talking about hieroglyphics? Yeah, Joe said, scrabbling at his arm once again. Hieroglyphics. And those things, hundreds of them amongst the rocks and seaweed, all shapes and sizes. Gold! Solid gold! We took them back to the village, my brother and I, and hid them away until we could decide what to do with them, but they, they came for them. Those things came in the storm from the sea, came to take them back, to take the people with them down to the, the cold, into the deep. I fooled them. He chuckled weakly. I hid the one place I knew they wouldn't look, in their own backyard out there on the sea. They'll come again. Tonight. They always come at night, can't stand the clean line of day. 
must be dark where they come from, so very dark. You have to give it back to them, Jeff. You have to give it back to them. For a moment, his grip tightened almost painfully, then fell away as the light faded from his eyes, and he breathed his last desperate breath. Jeffrey sat there for some time, staring at the thing in his hand and waited. Just as the sun started to sink into the west, he clambered out of the boat and he knelt on the beach, holding the golden idol towards the sea. As darkness fell, he closed his eyes and prayed to whatever god might be listening and waited. After what seemed like an eternity, he heard a splash of water and crunching on the gravel before him. Suddenly, his skin began to crawl and the hair on the back of his neck stood to attention. He could feel its presence now looming over him, something ancient, a dweller from the deep, an outsider, something beyond the understanding of men. He could feel its animosity and a cold hatred radiating from it in waves, causing him to break out in a cold sweat as an icy hand closed over his own. He nearly fainted then at the feel of that terrible hand. It felt like nothing more than then bone covered in cold jelly, yet it radiated a terrible heat. Then it was gone. And the idol with it. For a moment he was tempted to open his eyes until he felt the creature's frigid breath upon his neck. Do not look at me. The creature gurgled, as if reading his mind. Do not look at me. At the sound of this terrible voice, he fainted away, only to awaken once again with the coming dawn. The creature was gone, the idol was gone, and so was Joe. He knew where they were now, his family, and he knew he must follow. Stripping off his clothes, he waded into the freezing waters, feeling it instantly sap his strength as it crashed over his legs, his waist, his chest. When a cold hand wrapped around his ankle, he opened his mouth to scream, and the ocean rushed in, filling his body with dark water. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to tell you thank you for watching tonight's video. Because this is October, I'm going to make this nice, short, and sweet. If you'd like to help support the show or the podcast, head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. If you'd like to get yourself some new Halloween and creepypasta-inspired teas, you can head over to etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. And if you want to catch me... Creeps McPasta and Mew during our live Halloween tour around the southern U.S., head over to creepypasta.showfetti.com. That's creepypasta.s-h-o-f-e-t-t-i.com. Hang on to your hats, kids, because this year is a 31-day Halloween countdown. Happy Halloween and sweet dreams. <laughs>